Good morning, everybody. After this introduction, I'll have a lot of difficulties in trying to respect our, uh, your expectations, I mean. Okay, I want to say honestly that it's really an honor to be here with you and to give a very important word of appreciation for Mircea Joana, for Alina Inaev, for all those who have worked for the realization of this uh, event for a very simple reasons. We, as Romanians, we are very clever, very inventive. We have a lot of ideas, but we have difficulties in keeping them working for a longer period of time. We are bored after one or two, and uh, we are renouncing. That's why I think an institution, as the Forum of Bucharest, I think it is a rare exception but it's raising a lot of hope for all of us who are working in this, uh, in this field. That's why it's uh, really a pleasure and I want to once again thank you very much for inviting me and offering me a chance to say a few words in this introductory uh, meeting. Yes, uh, your idea is excellent. And the subject is very important, the relation between the center and periphery, bridging the divide, as you put it very, very well. It's one of the most important issues with which we are confronted. I am uh, hence confronted with a well-known dichotomy, widely discussed over the last two centuries, and especially brought forward under various interpretations in several recent key speeches on the future of Europe, which were already mentioned by, by Mr. Joanna. It is true that we witness an autumn animated by an overwhelming number of inspirational discourses appealing to unity, to overcoming divisions, and above all, to rediscovering the European common values and consensual interests. I personally believe in the need for such forward-looking visions about our common future. They are there to guide our decisions when we reach the crossroads of history in order to build a lasting future for our world. Two weeks ago, the President of the European Commission, Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker, pointed out that Europe extends from Vigo to Varna, from Spain to Bulgaria practically, and that, and I quote, our continent must continue to breathe with both its lungs, end of quotations, from east to west and from north to south, and this is really a very interesting approach. It was his metaphorical way, I think, of saying that Europe's chances to revival is based on unity and solidarity, and no center or periphery in Europe has two lungs. Shortly thereafter, French President Emmanuel Macron revealed his ambitious proposals for reforming the European project by reiterating his advocacy of a multi-speed aspirational and inspirational Europe. In French sounds much better, but it's good even in English. A Europe, in his opinion, with a renewed Franco-German partnership serving as a motor, as an engine, driving the EU forward, it's one of his main ideas. It was his turn to put a positive spin on the idea that building a strong and efficient core with countries agreeing on specific reforms might not have to wait for a wider consensus to move ahead. Obviously, this dilemma of unity without uniformity is difficult to overcome in Europe of 27 members. However, we could try to rethink, in essence, by abolishing dogmatic, antagonistic models. 
The dialogue on the future of Europe needs to move beyond the sterile clash positions and explore creative solutions that can bridge the divide. As Aspen and GMF have put it forth today, eventually even eliminating the temptation of a further divide. Perhaps it is the time to think of a Europe shaped like the current interpolar system, a Europe as a network or a flexible architecture of networks of inseparably interconnected centers where values, projects and ideas can be reciprocally transferred to the benefit of all actors to capitalize on them. Europe as a sum of networks where the dots on the map unite the mutual flow of ideas, data, information, trade, human exchanges, and so on. It is time to think of a continent without core and periphery, projecting its transformative power within its societies as well as beyond its borders. The European project has never been built on self-contained principles. Europe's architecture has been shaped by its engagement with the rest of the world, by encounters with the EU member states, with the Western Balkans candidate countries and those in the Eastern neighborhood, as well as by its strong relation with the partnership across the Atlantic. We have to keep ourselves open to the positive influence of these shaping factors in order to keep alive the Union's force of attraction. I am therefore on the side of those who say we should go beyond traditional dichotomies, core versus periphery, federalism versus intergovernmentalism, more versus less Europe, East versus West, North versus South, old new, old European uh, countries, new European countries, and so on and so forth. Let us focus mainly on what can we lead, what can we arrive, how can we arrive at a better Europe, a Europe able to regain the confidence of its citizens, even if the ones living in the very classically considered EU centers. We all know that over the last couple of years, the EU has been confronted with uncertainty and multiple crises, from the security pressures to Brexit, the threat of terrorism, and the rise of populism, to the migration crisis or economic and financial challenges. In the light of the British vote to leave the EU, and the emergence of populism in several member states, some serious doubts were voiced across Europe and beyond whether the EU would survive 2017, or this was just the beginning of the end. However, approaching the end of 2017, we can say that EU survived is both in better shape and in a better mood, and there are still a number of reasons for staying optimistic. I am convinced that precisely these challenges facing Europe have brought a positive meaning of the crisis to the forefront, the strong and widely shared certainty that an integrated Europe future offers clear, better prospects for European countries and citizens than a fragmented one. One year ago, the Bratislava Declaration reiterated the strengths of the EU raison d'etre, highlighting the fact that EU remains indispensable for addressing any new challenges we are confronted with. On the same line, the declaration adopted by the EU EU leaders on the 16th anniversary of the Rome Treaty on March 2017 reaffirmed that, I quote, 
the union is undivided and indivisible, end of quote. However, beyond these political statements, there is, uh, there is a risk that a complacent Europe may move its attention from various concrete problems. While today, European Union leaders are rather justified in feeling confident and ambitious, it is essential to remain realistic and pragmatic and to avoid overconfidence as one year ago we were trying to avoid over depression. Let me speak about a few points. The first one, when setting new ambitions for the European Union, any roadmap needs to be based on a solid understanding of the EU's vulnerabilities and a realistic assessment of its potential. It's the basic approach. Otherwise, the current European euphoria might pave the way to another descent into pessimism, polarization, and deadlocks. European leaders must continue to strengthen the European consensus by pursuing pragmatic, results-oriented, ambitious, but realistic and widely shared priorities. Second, it is important to regularly check the pulse of populism, as well as of the Eurosceptic and liberal tendencies, to be sure that these symptoms do not turn from controllable chronic diseases into pandemics. It will be a real disaster. We must to be strong enough and to look into the caricature of Europe these trends are drawing and learn that where the real Europe needs improvement. The third point, we should make efforts to bridge any divisions by engaging the European citizens and by promoting common and inclusive initiatives for the benefits of all EU member states. Even if both Paris and Berlin have pro-European leaders with strong new mandates after the elections, which is an excellent opportunity to revitalize uh, uh, the European project, their cooperation is a crucial but not a sufficient condition for the EU to move forward while preserving unity and cohesion. In order to avoid any centrifugal dynamics, it would be useful for Franco-German initiatives to get the support and stimulate ownership of, gov of governments of North-South and East-West alignments. Fourth, it is essential to use flexibility and variable speed scenarios with prudence, keeping them as a measure of last resort. The EU should aim for as much unity as possible and as much flexibility as strictly necessary. Last but not least, Europe should continue to enhance the transatlantic partnership, which in fact is irreplaceable, and it represents the main pillar of European security and stability. The EU and US need to work together to prevent major conflicts in the world and to jointly manage the pressures that erode the very fundaments of the international system. Jean Monnet's uh, words he used to say, and I quote, continue, il n'y a pas pour les peuples d'Europe d'autre avenir que dans l'Union, end of quote. These words still today have an inspiring significance, especially in the context of the future of uh, Europe debates. Our leaders in Romania are determined to continue. We are discussing ways to become a refounding member of the European Union, upholding core values of the European projects, and aiming at real convergence in order to become a Eurozone member. Having such in-depth discussions in Bucharest demonstrates the analytical toolbox 
of the center periphery paradigm uh, in is long gone. I would rather believe our world is one of networks and free flows. And I hope the free flows of ideas will be the main characteristic for the Bucharest Forum debates during this year's edition too. Thank you very much.